This is Ashton Ellett. Uh, we're here with Frank Barron in Rome, Georgia. It is July 7th, 2016. We're going to be discussing the history of Interstate 75 through Northwest Georgia, uh, starting with Coca-Cola's uh, Coca-Cola bottling interest uh, in, in relation to transportation and the interstates. So if you want to go ahead and start with where we were going to going to start. I, I, I think what I would like to say is when I got out of the Navy in 1955 and went to work full time, uh, our family and organization had six coca plants. They ranged from Fort Valley, Georgia, which worked Perry, which is part of this conversation. Carrollton, which worked later on I-20. Cedar Town, which did not ever work and have an interstate. Cartersville, which was going to be affected by I-75 in North Georgia. Dalton, which had an interstate running for, or planned interstate running right through it. And then of course Rome, which didn't. Uh, in 1965, we bought Valdosta, which of course was straddled I-75. I, I say those things so that you will understand that in our business, we knew how an interstate highway affected a community, uh, not only from our point of view as a Coca-Cola bottling uh, enterprise, which was seven plants by the time we bought the Valdosta one, uh, but also how it affected the communities and the uh, fact that it, the effect on the communities affected was as dramatic as the effect on communities not affected. In fact, in some ways, the not affected ones were more dramatically damaged or affected than the ones that had the interstate. Um, the interstates, uh, the objection, the prime objection, this was in those, at that time, in, in the space of time in 1956 and 7, the interstate program under Eisenhower was well underway, and we pretty well knew where the roads were going to go. Uh, the history of that, of course, was affected greatly by Eisenhower's experience in Europe, World War II with the Autobahn, when the Germans so effectively moved troops around on those four-lane highways. Well, of course, it made infinite sense during the Cold War and during the Eisenhower days, not only from a military point of view, which is his first concern, but from a business point of view. Uh, it was pretty important to be able to get from Atlanta to Savannah without having to go through Statesboro, Monroe, and everything else. Uh, in our case, the interstate movement in the Coca-Cola bottling business was not as important at that beginning point of time uh, when I first was working. But what happened was is that the people in the communities immediately reacted negatively towards interstates because the theory was, oh, they're going to ruin, are they going to ruin, they're going to take the business out of downtown and they're going to ruin our community. We don't want that interstate going through our community. Well, that's fine. They were correct. It would take it out of downtown. But if you didn't have it on your, the edge of your town, it went to the town where they did have it. Uh, I can cite you example out of, after example. Uh, but let me just sort of start with Valdosta, which already had the beginnings of interstate. My memory is not good enough in 1965 when we first went down there and began working Valdosta, but the interstate at that time, as I recall, probably went from at least Lake City, Florida, to maybe Unadilla, some 50 miles north. Uh, I can remember when we bought that plant, my job was to go to Valdosta three times a month. I'd leave Rome at 5.30 in the morning and drive down to US 41 and eagerly wait for the next few miles when I could get on a 14 mile stretch from <laughs> Griffin to somewhere, Locust Grove or whatever it was. 
and it opened in sections, and I was very familiar with what was going to happen in those days. And <laughs> when it finally opened from Atlanta all the way to Valdosta, uh, even through the last portion, which I think was Unadilla North to maybe uh, Cordell, I can't, I just can't remember. Somewhere it's, it, 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 it would be somewhere near Somewhere there. near that. I remember that yeah. last opening, probably 74, 5, long in there. I thought uh, everything would just be wonderful. About that time, our group decided to buy an airplane, so I didn't get <laughs> And I also turned that plant over to one of my younger relatives, so I didn't get to enjoy the, the, the highway. Uh, the, the, the same thing happened, back to the Valdosta situation, uh, Valdosta being not Atlanta, and not Jacksonville, but a sophisticated pit stop between the two became a marketing shopping center for that area of the world. Uh, this at the expense of Quitman, Lakeland, other little towns around which just real, Homer just dried up. Uh, I think that probably a great deal of our thinking in the later days of highway of, of the interstate as it affected North Georgia was dramatically affected by the thinking and the things that we saw happen in, in, in Lowndes County. Uh, the effect on a town like Whitman, which was a thriving little agricultural town, two things happened. First of all, agriculture ceased to be the uh, labor-intensive thing that it was in, in years past, and then there wasn't anything happening there. The traffic, the marketing, the new Sears Roebuck, uh, the new Belk Roads, the shopping centers were all in, in, in Valdosta, and they were there because you could get there. Not only could you get there, but the people who supplied the Sears Roebucks and the Publixes and whatever, they could get their tractors and trailers to the market. Uh, it was a win-win situation. The argument begin the argument against an, an interstate coming through your little town began to fade as people realized this is going to happen. The, the question is, do you want it to happen to you, or do you want to take charge of? what's going to happen. Now, in our business, and, and I say this with a, a, a sense of, of, of pride, but, but also uh, not to overemphasize our part in the thing, but in our unique position, having Coca-Cola plants scattered up and down the, the, the state with interstates running through some and not through others, we saw dramatically what could happen to the growth that not only was okay, the service stations moved out and, and, and there was a Chick-fil-A and a McDonald's on every corner and a lot of folks who formerly had farms sitting out in the middle of nowhere were millionaires because they sold four corners to an intersection and, and everybody was happy. Uh, and upon those four intersections sat an Exxon and a Shell and a BP and, and uh, McDonald's and. Wendy's on the other corner, mm -hmm. so, so life went on. This did penalize the downtowns, there's no question about it, but the reality was downtown was only three blocks away in the Valdosta instance, so people learned to cope. Uh, again, to Valdosta, because I think that was one that we saw forming while we sat down and looked at it in the late 60s. Uh, Valdosta State College, for example, began to be, instead of a regional two-year uh, step up to some report to that heavenly place in Athens, Georgia, <laughs> it, it, it became a destination for a good education and subsequently became a four-year college. I rather doubt that would have happened without the easy access of the access of the interstates. And so the kids from South Georgia who lived over there again in Quitman, other towns of that nature, 
uh, were able to go to Valdosta and become well-educated, not just kind of educated. Uh, that gr and, and I use that just as a growth symbol because the same thing happened to the, again, the Belk Groves, the Sizzle. Mm -hmm. the, the whole community benefited. Uh, it would not be an unfair statement to say that the folks that owned the property down on Ashley Street, the main street, suffered a little bit because they did. The smart ones saw what was happening and probably bought the property out there on the interstate and foresaw what was happening. I, I don't know that. Shifting back up to Fort Valley, for example, Fort Valley had a Coca-Cola plant, it was a very small one, but we worked Perry, Georgia out of Fort Valley. Well, guess what happened? The interstate went right through, slap, the edge of Perry. So we enjoyed the growth there. We saw what happened there. Fort Valley became a, a mere shadow of itself, for myself. Uh, Dalton, of course, the, the location, and, and, and if we get closer to North Georgia in describing that, that, that phenomenon, Dalton's location was pretty much dictated by a place called Rocky Face. It was a pass through the mountains. And, and, and you knew that the interstates were going to go through Atlanta and Chattanooga, and you knew they were going to go to Savannah. Uh, you knew they were going to go to Augusta. Interestingly enough, they didn't go to Columbus. So what did they do? They ran a little spur down there. 185. Like 185. Because the people in Columbus at one time was the largest city in the United States that didn't have an access to it. And so the people, the uh, governor, I think it was, uh, oh, I can't remember who was governor. It was. Uh, what year? Oh, probably, I guess, 75, 78. George Busby. No, it was before George. It was. It could have been, been Jimmy Carter. It'd be Carter Busby, Joe Frank. But it was. It was before Joe. It may have been Joe Frank. So eighty two. Could be. Could be. Could be. Um, but in in any case, I, I really think it was before that. His his widow still living, and I see her. She married a Russell. She was a Russell. She's on the uh, Richard B. Russell board of Uh Van, well, if Vandiver was Van der Kar yeah, yeah Vandiver. Yeah. Okay, so oh well, so we're we're talking. Well, I'll 50, just see he was right after Eisenhower. If you're, yeah, if you're, yeah, if you're, you're right. And, and this was when, yeah. when the formation of these things. Oh yeah, happened. yeah. There was always the rumor that a, a law was in the interstates that there had to be a every x miles there had to be a four mile stretch. That's not true. That is not. That was a a, a nice myth. It's it's a long lasting myth. Everybody you talk to, everybody right thinks now, it was think a runway. True. Well, that, yep. that was a myth, and that we, we we knew that wasn't true. But as we moved north, the geography of North Georgia, starting probably Marietta, Atlanta, maybe even north, you begin to run into physical restrictions, which were far more pervasive than anything in Valdosta. At Valdosta, you could move it two, three, four miles in any direction, it wouldn't make any difference. <laughs> Same thing true in Fort Valley. Same thing's true in Metter. <laughs> Statesboro, it didn't matter. Uh, but when you get into North Georgia, you run into a lot of things. For example, you run into hydroelectric plants. I say, uh, for example, uh, when you take 85 as it uh, headed up towards Gainesville, Georgia, and on into South Carolina, uh, you ran into Lake Lanier. Now those lakes, and I won't spend a lot of time dwelling on the lakes, but the lakes which were mostly built as hydroelectric dams for the electrical stuff. And if you read the charters upon which these lakes were built, they're all a little bit different. Some of them say hydroelectric power is the first thing and flood control is the second thing uh, and rec recreation is the third thing. Uh, but what happened was the things turned back around and recreation became the big money maker, but the charters didn't do that, so the lakes went up and down. Some of that's been corrected, but mm -hmm. not all of it. But the, the fact is that by the mid-60s and when the interstate projects really started, those dams were there, and you couldn't move the lake. Um, 
as I mentioned, how is you come, and I'm going to start in a little bit of a different way, and let's start at Chattanooga and move south. Great. That interstate had to go through Rocky Face because that lower part of the Appalachian Mountains was a tough, was a tough bite. Uh, it was a very expensive bite if you chose to draw a straight line from Chattanooga to Atlanta, you were going to cut through a swath of mountains, 12, 1,500 feet high. Uh, it wasn't named Rocky Face, but for one reason, and that was full of rocks, and that was a huge issue. So they went through the Rocky Face path. Well, when that happened, the interstate was placed to the east portion there, which meant it went right straight through Dalton. Well, we had a Coca-Cola plant in Dalton, and as you might imagine, we were elated because we had seen what was happening in, in Valdosta. We had seen Fort Valley. Um, the 20 through the part of our Carrollton thing was not an issue as much, but it, the same, same factors applied there. Uh, and what we saw in our Cedartown plant, to repeat myself, we saw that Cedartown had no growth. It had no access to an interstate. It was sort of like Rome sitting out there by itself. When the interstate left Dalton, there was an issue. Uh, this would have been in the really late 60s. Mm -hmm. There was, in the federal interstate planning, which was, I never did really know whether the state or the feds had the final word. Uh, I think, not to be accusatory would be the right word, I think they both danced around and if they didn't want to answer you, they would tell you it was the feds, and if the feds didn't want to answer you, they'd tell you it was the state. Uh, but anyway, what, what the issue was is that the planners of the interstate took into consideration not only cost, which they, course they had to, but they thought it would be a pretty thing to run I-75 across Lake Altoona. Well, we had a little cocoa plant in Cartersville, and that was the closest one to Rome, so we decided that this was A, not the thing to do for the cocoa business, B, it was not the thing to do to a lake to put seven bridges across it, and C, in that it had to swing widely to the east in order to do this. Uh, here again, um, I happened to be at those days the responsible manager of the Cardinal crowd, so I spent a lot of time in, in Bartow County, and I found that I really a lot of my comments about who wanted the interstates and who didn't is formed by my relationships with the people in Cartersville. And the people in Cartersville were of two separate and distinct minds. One group said, oh, it's just going to be the most beautiful thing for people coming from the north to drive down through Altoona and cross those seven bridges and great. Uh, my answer was, in, uh, how do you think that's going to affect you when you can't put a service station on a bridge across the river? So they're going to go to Marietta, get gas, or they're going to buy it up in Calhoun. Oh, well, but it's going to be pretty. There was another group who said, why don't we really pull that interstate as it proceeds south towards Atlanta on the west side of Cartersville, so it'll be just about as easy to get to Rome as it is to get to Cartersville. Well, that suited us fine, but actually, uh, we I personally didn't care as long as it didn't go across the lake. Uh, I'd have to be honest with you and tell you I was affected because I had a houseboat. I spent a lot of weekends over at Altoona, and I didn't want to be sitting on a bridge full of cars. <laughs> uh, some, of, some of the thinking, the arguments that we put together, and I've given you a newspaper mm -hmm. article, and I'll get to that in a second. Uh, some of the arguments had to do with Bartow County, you're really, you, if you put it across the lake, you're going to lose all access to it. You're not going to have any service stations. You're not going to have any McDonald's on the corner. You're not going to have any enhanced real estate. 
you're not going to have any industrial growth because the thing's going to be too far away from your community. If you pull it off the lake, move it west, at least towards the town, and preferably selfishly, that's what America's all about, isn't it? <laughs> move it on the other side or the west side of Cartersville, well, then you got two towns to deal with. You got Rome and Cartersville. So there was one group that was on how to put this, our side that wanted to move it. And there was one group who didn't. Uh, and I would go meet with these guys. It was all very friendly. And they, these were uh, not acrimonious arguments, but any stretch of the imagination. The fact was, and, and I don't say this uh, the way it's going to sound, but, but, but the fact was that the general population of Cartersville didn't have it. They didn't know what they were getting. They didn't know what it was going to do. They were afraid of it. It's going to ruin the downtown shopping. My friend, friend, don't get it. And you're talking about ruining it. There won't be any to ruin. <laughs> but you understand, we had seen interstates in Dalton, Valdosta, Fort Valley. Mm -hmm. And we saw, we said, let me tell you what happens. Go down to Quitman, for example. Uh, go to Chatsworth and see what happened when Dalton got the interstate. I mean, it is it is so obvious to us because as people who had Coca-Cola trucks going to every little Hamlet store in the woods, Broad Street, Main Street, we we saw very easily our numbers weekly and daily told us what was happening, and then I said, you know what. This is what's going to happen to you. Well, the issues got clouded. The, 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 the arguments began to get a little bit more than uh, friendly. Uh, we were accused of being selfish. Coca-Cola folks weren't trying to get uh, business. But, but, but it was more than that. We were accused of being industrially minded. And we were. We were big chamber of commerce people. We were after growth. Uh, we saw it as one, uh, either one of two things. You either grow or you shrink. Which do you want? You don't stand still. This country doesn't stand still. This country is moving from the tip of Florida to the top of Maine to the west coast of California. You're either growing or you're shrinking. You ain't standing still. We knew that. We, 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 we instinctively knew it and we had the proof of it because we saw what was happening to our markets from the Florida line to the Tennessee line. And it, it, was, it was a fluid thing. It kept moving. So we tried everything we could. We, 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 we tried to enlist the Bartow County people. Uh, the powers that be just thought of, they kept falling back on their beautiful lake and the bridges and how pretty that was going to be. Can, can I interrupt for a second? You, you said the powers that be. Could you um, sort of parse out who who, well, who, the who, who were the, the, those well, individuals? One of the most powerful guys who was president of the bank was a good friend of mine, as was his son, who subsequently became president of that bank. And I'd go see him and I'd say, Billy, let me... Listen, let me talk to you about what I know, what I see, what I've seen in my own eyes and what our business records show. And he just stonewalled me and he says, you know, Frank, I, I appreciate what you're doing. You're trying to help Cartersville, but you're just wrong. And I, Mr. Shedd, sir, I, you're the one that's wrong because I, I, I kind of think I know what I'm talking about. Because I've seen it. I, I wasn't arrogant. I was trying not to be this man with some other than I. He was against us. Uh, the politic county commissioner, a guy named Smith, what the fuck was his first name? You've got to understand, gentlemen, this was nearly 50 years ago. <laughs> all, all this stuff we can follow up. I can follow up with this stuff in the archives and records. So that that's, but anyway, that's good. I'm, I'm talking about how bad my memory is. <laughs> <laughs> Seems anyway, pretty good right now. So you, <laughs> anyway, you uh, the powers that be, that was one of my main contacts because he was such a good friend of mine. And, and, and I say that because I trusted him and I knew he'd tell me exactly what people were saying and 
Well, the Chamber of Commerce, we just think you're wrong. We think you people are awful. Well, we hired a guy, and if you recall the name Dean Rusk, who was Secretary of the State, He's he was a Marietta. Familiar name, yeah. Well, Dean Rusk was a, a Marietta boy. His brother, whose name was Rusk, was a journalist in Miami, and he had retired. I cannot remember his first name. And he was dabbling around looking for something to do, and we found out about it through Dean Rusk's cousin, that was a dear friend of ours. He said, he'll come up here and put on a, a newspaper campaign for you, and, and, and we'll try to switch the tide. And if the political powers see that there's a movement that wants to move it, why, well, it may get moved. We didn't know what else to do, so we did. And that brochure that you've got that says how to move it was put together by Mr. Rusk. Well, we were fighting the issue, and, and finally, a fellow by the name of Philip Greer, Dr. Philip Greer. Dr. Greer, probably after your idol at the University of Georgia, uh, he and his brother both taught over there, the number first, Eugene Odom. Yeah. Dr. Eugene Odom and Philip Greer were, were contemporaries. Dr. Greer was at, he was at Shorter College what Dr. Odom was at the University of Georgia. And let me, before I talk too much about the University of Georgia, I did not go to the University of Georgia. I know. <laughs> I've been following, uh, looking at the memorabilia. So oh, okay. you, you went up to Virginia then. Washington and Lee. Beautiful college. Oh yeah, I had a great time. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I have a great, deep, abiding interest in the University of Georgia. I have a lot of friends over there. Dr. Odom was a particular hero of mine. And as I said, I had a boat over there. My brother-in-law had a boat over there. My best friend Scott Henson had a boat over there. And we'd go over there and spend weekends and fish and, and, and take our wives and kids and cook out. And, and we loved the lake. We, 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 we were all bird hunters. We were all fishermen. We were all nature freaks, and uh, I'm a bird watcher if there ever was one. And, and, and it always sort of surprised folks to find out that people who were in business back in that day, we're talking 60s and 70s and all, have the ecology and the, and, and the environment as a top priority of theirs. We live here too. Uh, I wasn't happy about tin cans of Coca-Cola scattered all over the world. I couldn't control it. I wasn't very happy about Coca-Cola bottles being thrown on the side of the road for two reasons. First, it wasn't good for the environment. And second, the doggone things were expensive and we wanted to get them back. But, but my point being that we did see that there was an environmental element I don't think at that time, now, my, what I'm fixing to talk about uh, might be subject to some correction, but I, I'm led to believe that it won't be. By this time, Bert Lance had become director of, of, of the State Highway Department, Commissioner mm -hmm. Highway, mm -hmm. DOT. And Bert was a good friend of mine, being from Calhoun, 20 miles up the road, where the interstate went through. Uh, and I would call Bert and go down and see him and beg and plead, and Bert, well, you know, the feds say this and that and all. So we finally, and the article that you got, which is a little unreadable, but if you go into the archives of the Bartow County paper, you can probably get a better print of that than the rest of the story. That's just what I have, and you can have that. Uh, Bert finally instituted what he called an environmental study. He says he said to Lloyd, my brother-in-law, and others, he said, "All right, damn it, if that's what y'all want, we'll just study it environmentally." Well, to Bert's great credit, he put together. Uh, a group of folks like, I don't know that Dr. Odom was on there, I don't know that Philip Greer was on there, but he had some unassailable personalities to go over there, look at it, count the bridges, look at what was going to happen with pilings and, and all the things that they did. And they came back after months of study and said, this would be a disaster. 
why would you put seven bridges across this beautiful lake when all you got to do is move it a half a mile or a mile or whatever the number was west, save $11 million in building construction? What in the world are you people thinking? Bert capitulated. He said, okay, if that's what you say, we're going to do it. And that's what they did. And th stop. Keep go, talking. Go, go, okay. I'll stop in a second. Go. Uh, they did, and if you'll read that article, you'll see that Bert had a press release. And it was big news. If you look at mm -hmm. that paper, you will see that. That's not only the headlines, it's above the headlines. Uh, a great victory for the people of Georgia, in my view. Uh, we won the battle, but we didn't win the battle for us. We won it for the state of Georgia. Now, Bert told me more than once after that, and I, I know, knew Bert all my life, visited with him. In fact, I had dinner, lunch with him in Calhoun at a barbecue restaurant about six months before he died a couple of years mm -hmm. ago. Bert was a dear friend, uh, and his widow is a friend of mine to this day. Bert did the right thing, and he told me, he said, Years later, he said, you know, we were the first state to formally initiate mm -hmm. for every highway you're going to do an environmental study because we don't know what's out there. Dare we talk about the Rollins boys? Probably not. <laughs> but anyway, uh, and they should. You've got Indian graves, you've got uh, historical monuments, mm -hmm. you've got buildings, you've got all kinds of things that you just ought to look at. You know, you may say, okay, tear it down, I don't, but somebody that knows what they're talking about ought to go look at them. And, and, and I will forever be grateful to Bert and his group at that time who had sense enough to say, you know, you guys, you guys are right. We should look at it. That should be part of the deal. Uh, as I said, I'm not sure that my facts that that was the f first one in the United States, but if it wasn't the first, it was dull and close to it. The, the, if, if I remember correctly, if I remember my Great Society legislation correctly, I think the first legislation was passed in 1969, and this was 70, 71 when the study would have been done, so it would have been among... The if, it, first. if it wasn't the first, it was darn close to it. It, it, it would have been among the first, it, it, especially since the interstate was supposed to be, the, the network in Georgia was supposed to be completed by 73, 74, but and there was sort of an oil, petroleum, well, economic crisis well, in, in, in the well, mid-70s as well. Well, <laughs> 72, the, drop, the bottom dropped out. Yeah. The economy went to hell in a basket. Mm -hmm. um, Price maybe, freezes, maybe not as bad as 2008, but it, but it was a, it was a pretty mm. rough year, too. I had some friends in the real estate business, and land went broke at that time. Mm. Tom Cousins was not one of them. Tommy David Lacey survived. But, but yeah, you're, you, you're right. Uh, the bottom line about Bert is, has been mentioned, of course, all the things that he did, but I think that Bert showed himself to be, in spite of some criticisms of this guy that he got when he was up there with Jimmy Carter, uh, to be an honorable guy. He did the right thing. He, he, he backed us up. He, he said, okay, you guys got a point. Um, it didn't hurt that, that we knew Bert and had access to him, but he did the right thing. And I've always been kind of proud to have been a part of that, that whole thing. Um, I was going to foray a little bit into the rest, but I think we talked about it earlier already. About that time, when that stretch was finished, I think everything from Atlanta south had been completed mm -hmm. and was open. 16, I can't talk about because I never... I, I might go there once a year for a meeting or some such thing. That's a that's a long road. <laughs> it is a long road <laughs> to Dallas, but it doesn't have the problems as we said earlier that we had up here. I mean, mm -hmm. we were 
We were dealing it's with It's very different topography oh, when you no get down question. to coastal in South Georgia. Uh, no question about it. But, but I just say I can't talk about 16 because I don't know. I also can't talk about 85 because I didn't have any con contact. Mm -hmm. 20 after it comes out of Atlanta, when it gets on that tour to fill a record back up in there, mm -hmm. that affected us. And it was uh, the, 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 the thing that, that, that happens, and, and Fort Valley would be a real good example of what we were talking about. Here's Fort Valley, here's Perry, and here's the interstate. Well, it used to be out of probably five or six, maybe six routes in Fort Valley. I mean, every little town had a cocoa. Maybe we had six trucks. One of them would go to Perry every day, maybe. And four of them would be around Fort Valley and, and back up in that area. Well, within five or six years, the thing had completely, you had three trucks every day in Perry and two in Fort Valley. I mean, it was that dramatic, and, 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 and our whole thrust was in talking to these people, if you don't know what's going to happen to you, you will call me up in two years and say, you ain't going to believe this, and I'm going to say, I sure as hell do, I saw it happen, <laughs> I tried to tell you. It, it, it was a dramatic change in what happened in the growth. Gainesville, Georgia. That, was a little bitty town that was torn up in 1934 by a hurricane. And look at Gainesville now. A governor and a lieutenant governor. You couldn't find two people to run for mayor up there back in those days. <laughs> but it grew because the interstate went over there. And then, of course, the uh, uh, proximity to the Athens and 316 didn't hurt. Uh, look at the Army. Do you think the Army would have stayed in Columbus if they hadn't had uh, 185? I doubt it. Right, right. I, I doubt it. I, I, w I would think they would have said, you know, you got, we got to be able to put a bunch of tanks and things on this road and get out of here and go to Atlanta and fly, whatever they had to do. Yeah, yeah and I, I just, just to sort of sidebar off onto a, a different topic that's, that's related to this, but, and you might remember, in the late 70s and 1980s when they got talking about developmental highways, these rural developmental highways, put you drive, you know, putting the four laning through like the fall line freeway uh, for, from Columbus to Macon to Augusta or Corridor Z that ran from Columbus to Brunswick. You know, is it, was that sort of a, a, the state government recognizing that it had to do something to assist areas that were left behind by the interstates. You could say that. I wouldn't agree with it, but you could say that. No, 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 no. <laughs> what, 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 Does what, the what name you're... Stevens, Senator Stevens, mean anything to you? Steve, uh, go, to, go from Alaska. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. yes. Oh, go, yeah. Go up there and go close to Juneau and look at the bridge to nowhere. Mm -hmm. Now, what happened in the development mental highways, I, 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 I personally think that it was mostly political reaction to complaining about folks, give us a four lane because we dying down here and look what happened over there in Cordell and boy look at Tifton which was nothing and and give us one and, and, and Lakeland, Georgia will become some or, or uh, Dublin. Oh man, we're going to grow. It ain't going to grow. It's just nothing. It, it, it has no function. It, you go back, in my view, the purpose of the highways is so that Walmart can get their stuff to Valdosta. Uh, there's not a reason for them to want to go to Dublin and whatever they do out of that huge warehouse they got, they can run up to Dublin every once a week and take care of the problem. The development of the highways, and I'm not an expert on highways by any stretch of imagination, but I think that was mostly reacting to political. But I'll tell you what's happened. Contrary to what anybody thought, nobody really thought this would happen, but I've got a place in Florida, which I'm going to tomorrow. It's being remodeled, we work it, in Jacksonville. You know how I, go, I'm, I, I get there? If I had my choice, I got to be in Atlanta, so it's everything's out of the way. 
I'll go from here to Cedartown to Carrollton, bypass LaGrange, go north for about a mile or two, 85 Columbus to Tifton. Or I found a little bit, bit better road that takes me to Valdosta and avoid all that stuff. It's all four lanes. All the state patrol guys are out here looking for wrecks. You can fly on those <laughs> I mean, you really can. So what's happened is those developmental highways are not developmental highways. They are access highways for people who don't want to go through Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Research that a little bit, and you'll be amazed at what you come up with. Yeah, it's, it's uh, do, doing the research through. Uh, Zell Miller, Joe Frank Harris, that, that sort of that sort of time time frame, you know, you're getting up into the, the period where the freeways are finished, 1978, 1979, when, when Tom Moreland finally finished it. Before they're even finished, great human being, by the way, but a, he a, a a prime mover and shaker. You know, so he, let's see, he was he was commissioner for 12 years, 75 to 87. You know, the only person that gets close to that is Mr. Jim. Uh, Gillis. I'll tell you a great and, story about Jim Gillis. And I wanted to talk. But you got to have to cut that thing off before I tell you the one of those stories. <laughs> I will definitely have to hear those. But but that, that that's sort of, you know, get, getting to, you know, with Moreland, with finishing the freeways and then immediately freeing the freeways, you know, the, the question being, what do the free what, what have the freeways meant in terms of positive I think we've talked about but in Atlanta main main criticism now is sort of the negative effects of, of, of too many freeways of, 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 of pavement everywhere well I, I happen to believe and I may be wrong I do not believe that the people of the United States and I've spent a lot of time in Europe since we so loud. I, I like to go to Europe, and I've ridden trains all over England and France, not so much all over Italy because I like to drive in Italy. <laughs> but I'm not convinced that the, the population of this country is going to sacrifice their automobile to ride on a fast train. I just don't think they're going to do it. Now, if we had started back in the 1910 and cars were not so easy, we would be a train riding community. We're not. So whether you like it or not, you're going to have to build the highways. Now, you may do it with, I get in my driverless car that's a Tesla S and go to sleep and say Chicago and wake up the next 10 hours later and I'm in Chicago. Yeah, and that's what's going to happen. But the other thing that's going to happen too, and you think about this, if that does happen, and it will, I won't be around to see it, but can you imagine 20 years from now, I'm in Atlanta in my condominium, and I'm sick of, of, of Uber, Uber, which I use all the time down there, because I want to go somewhere and have a glass of steel wine. I don't want to go to jail. So you go Uber, and then for $4, and I get delivered back, or 7 or whatever it is. But suppose I called a driverless car and go there. Well, think about this. When that driverless car lets me out, like Uber, the restaurant doesn't have to have a parking lot anymore. What's that going to mean? What if the parking lots of Atlanta weren't necessary anymore because people, nobody parked the car? Because the cars, they probably don't own a car. Driverless car, I want to go to Rome. Take me to Rome. I'm in Rome. I get out, the driverless car goes, I don't really care. I don't care. Now, if you think that's not going to happen, stick around 25 more years, and, you, and that's what will happen. That concept is so, I mean, how do you, you can't stop it. <laughs> that's a good point. I, 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 I but, think but, that, but, but it goes back to the, what you said. Mm. People are upset about too many highways in the Tom Moreland effect and all that kind sure. of stuff. I will tell you the Jim Gillis story. Do you if, want me to pause this? You, no, you can listen to this. My uncle was a great man, a great businessman, but he was a bit on the <laughs> arrogant side. And he wanted something done up here. I was not there when he happened, when this happened, but he used to tell this story. And finally, in later years, he got away, he could laugh about it, but earlier on, it made him mad every time anybody mentioned it. 
which we did a lot. <laughs> but anyway, he decided to go down to see Mr. Gillis. Now in those days, the highway board consisted of three people, a North Georgia guy, a Middle Georgia guy, and a South Georgia guy. And what they said went. That's how the roads got built. So he went down there to see Mr. Gillis and said, Mr. Gillis, I'm from Rome, Georgia, and we want this little road and something paved. And Gillis, being a politician, well, Mr. Brown, we'll check and I'll let you know. And, and that, and, then, and Alfred said, and you're running to be reelected pretty soon, and I'll just promise you, I'll help you, and we'll get you reelected. Mr. Gillis said, Mr. Barron, do you know what I have to do to get reelected? No, sir, what? He said, well, maybe my uncle said that, maybe I had a heart attack sitting there. And it was several years before he could laugh about that, but that's the way it worked. That's true. Oh, Chris. Cut that thing off for just a second. <laughs> What I'm going to say right now is personal opinion, but I feel very strongly when you talk about Atlanta traffic, the biggest mistake in the last 10 or 15 years that has been made is when uh, the environmentalists who were doing what they're supposed to, and I support all those organizations, but they stopped what was called the outer perimeter. And the reason they gave for stopping it is because if we build that road, it'll just develop around it. Oh, really? Uh, what's going to happen if you don't build it? Well, they're going to develop up there anyway. Well, you better fix a way to get out here. I got relatives, uh, did for many years over there in Commerce, Georgia. You can't get to Commerce, Georgia from Rome, Georgia. You got to go to Atlanta. And how would you like to look forward to driving down through Spaghetti Junction and then back later this afternoon? I did. The outer perimeter would have solved a lot of Atlanta's problems because the Chattanooga, New England, wherever it's coming from, could have gone around there and gotten up to Gainesville, gotten over here to eventually to 16 and or 85. And they stopped it. And I don't really know that you could do it. Now, I think the growth has so impeded that you would, you the, would have to spend a The bit. cost estimates were already at, it was over a billion. It was going to be and, very expensive. And, and that was when Roy was still, or Governor Barnes was still, yeah. still in Well, office. you know, of course it's done, in, it's done in Los Angeles, it's done in Washington, it's done in Boston, to my knowledge. Uh, I don't know that much about Philadelphia, but if you think about those things, you got what we got to ring around Atlanta, which is traffic in Harlem, but if you put another one around there, sure it would solve it for 30 years. But I mean, not doing it, does that solve the problem? No. It did people screaming and hollering, mad at everybody, shooting each other all around the highway. <laughs> but I, I, but that that outer perimeter would have solved that northwest excuse me northeast corner problem, and it would have it would have been so beneficial to us in North Georgia, because we got the one thing in the state of Georgia, when 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 the powers that be ever really realize what we've got that nobody else has got. You know what we got? We got war. You guys have ridden around Rome a little bit today. Mm -hmm. You can't get anywhere without riding across the river. We got 600 million gallons a minute going down that road, that coosa. Yeah. Someday they're going to find it. <laughs> Who's they? Who's they? Florida. <laughs> Apalachico. <laughs> I don't want to mess up the fishing down there because I'm going down there in about two months. <laughs> Eat some oysters. Well, Mr. Barron, this has been this has been great. We should just we should just do one of these every week or month or so, and we can just talk about all sorts of different things. Well, whatever. <laughs> but no, th I mean th this was great. Don't sell yourself short on your memory. I, th I think you. Well, you are peeling this side. It's like all the other stuff I've forgotten. <laughs> Some of it is selective forgetting. Well, sure, 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 sure. <laughs> Well, that's great.